Hello, welcome to Kobe Time, a podcast series on markets and economies from DBS Group Research. I'm Taimur Beg, Chief Economist. Welcome to a special episode with a commentary from yours truly on Singapore's renewed pandemic stringency. Singapore stepped into the second quarter with a spring in its step. March auto sales, retail sales, and dining out were growing robustly, and the same with industrial production, trade, uh, in particular exports hitting record highs in March up to 41.3 billion, up 27.8%. Labor market was picking up, business confidence was on the rise, and company earnings were on the mend as well. As April data starts to trickle in, they will most likely show a continuation of the trend but May and June will be quite different, unfortunately. The authorities imposed a month of stringent measures on May 16, driven by concerns over a rise in community cases. As dining in is suspended, large gatherings curtailed, and work from home becomes the norm again, domestic activities are bound to take a hit. In addition to the usual concern about resurging cases in South and parts of Southeast Asia, two other matters have come up. First, the spread of a particularly virulent variant of the coronavirus, namely B1167, is a major vexing matter for public health officials. The further muted form of B1167 is B1167.2, which has been spreading rapidly in India and to some extent in the UK. Data suggests, but not yet confirm, that the variant is highly transmissible. Second, A few instances have come up in which fully vaccinated individuals have caught the COVID-19 infection and passed it on to others, and that could be driven by this variant or any other variant that's been around the world for a few months. As more data come in, public health professionals would be able to make the call if the practice that has caught on in Western economies, which is to relax mask mandates for those vaccinated, is sound or premature. Until then, an abundance of caution warrants some degree of reinforced stringency on mobility and proximity, which is where Singapore stands right now. The WHO has already designated B1167 as a variant of concern, with data from India showing nearly 30% of new infections there are stemming from that variant family. Even in the UK, which is presently characterized by a dramatic decline in hospitalization and fatalities, the variant has begun to raise its head. At last count, it has been detected in 44 countries, including Singapore and the U.S., and I reiterate, it is not just B1167, we have other variants stemming from U.K., Brazil, and South Africa that one should be concerned about as well. Now, all these concerns notwithstanding, early data clearly suggests the usefulness of vaccines in dealing with the coronavirus, and that is true in general across coronavirus and these variants as well. Now, although vaccinations do not fully eliminate the risk of catching the virus and passing it on, Singapore's experience in the past weeks is already supportive of those with vaccination not having to face any serious health consequences after catching COVID-19. This, in my view, is the essence of the pandemic battle. As long as nations manage to vaccinate a large, if not all, of their at-risk population, they will be able to deal with new waves of infection, even if they are virulent. Now, at-risk population itself is a bit of a nebulous concept. Does it mean all the people over the age of 45, or everybody who is a first responder, or everybody who has comorbidities? Perhaps all of the above. Anyway, on the road to vaccination, Singapore has picked up the pace with over 3 million doses administered already. We reckon that in a month or six weeks' time, a critical mass of at-risk population will be vaccinated, adding a sense of safety in the community. A more aggressive campaign to remove residual hesitancy regarding vaccination, making vaccines available to a wider community, examining the possibility of vaccinating children, these are all critical dimensions of putting the pandemic to rest. There is growing recognition among public health officials that shifting from a policy of outright suppression to considering SARS-CoV-2 an endemic virus may be warranted. Governments around the world may follow that shift eventually, but only after mass vaccination. What does this month of mobility restriction mean for Singapore's economic outlook? We think what happened in Japan in the first quarter may be instructive for Singapore's second quarter outturn. 
Japan's real GDP likely contracted by 2% on a quarter-on-quarter seasonally adjusted annualized rate as domestic demand deteriorated due to the resurgence of COVID-19 and that fully offset the recovery in exports. Singapore had the makings of domestic and external demand complementing each other through April, but May and June would be setbacks, which may well cause a quarter-on-quarter decline in activities, even if exports continue to perform well. On a year-on-year basis, though, the growth numbers will be amply positive. None of the new restrictions are comparable to the severe stringency implemented during last year's circuit breaker. Protocols to continue with production, transportation, work, and school are well in train, so the economy can carry on. Still, a decline in footfalls will hurt retail and recreation vendors, sentiments will be dented, and planned activities which would have added momentum to the economy would be postponed. Singapore's outlook just got rather clouded. But between vaccination and public sector support, coming out from the May-June turbulence ought to be easier. That's it for this special episode of Kopi Time. Martin Tucky produced this show with support from Daisy Sharma and Violet Lee. All Kopi Time episodes are available on YouTube, on all major podcast platforms as well, including Apple, Google, and Spotify. As for our research publications, you can find them by Googling DBS Research Library. Have a great day. Stay safe. Stay healthy.